Hi, I am Amanda Stone, the branch librarian at the Chapin branch of the Lexington County Public Library. I would like to welcome everybody to the virtual program today and introduce our speaker, Jay Keck from the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. I know he's done some wonderful in-person programs for us in the past, and we look forward to today's discussion. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we have muted everybody in the audience um, just for ease of listening, but if you have a question, you certainly can unmute yourself or you can type it into the chat and I will make sure that Jay sees it. We will be recording this session as you heard and we'll be posting it on our library's YouTube page. Okay, now I'm going to turn the controls over to Jay. Okay, getting pretty close. And let me pull that up. <clears throat> All right, Amanda, can you see that then? I sure can. Hopefully. All right, let me just move something around. Okay, uh, yeah, so I appreciate that, Amanda. Um, I'm, I'm always excited to talk about nature, conservation, um, but especially birds. Um, so my name is Jay Keck. I work for South Carolina Wildlife Federation, um, and I'm the Habitat Education Manager. <clears throat> so I go uh, to a lot of um, homes. I go to a lot of uh, uh, businesses, um, public um, you know, uh, places like schools, libraries, um, even churches, and help them create create uh, spaces for wildlife um, in hopes, you know, that that attracts, um, you know, some of the people that use those facilities to, to kind of connect with nature. Um, also have big businesses, businesses that uh, have, you know, hundreds of acres, if not more, that want to do something for wildlife <clears throat> on their property. So uh, visit places around the, uh, around the state. They support us uh, financially because we're, we're nonprofit. Um, but they also uh, do things on their property uh, for wildlife, and then they, uh, uh, a lot of them have um, education opportunities for, for the public in the, in the cities or towns that, that they're near. Um, and then my favorite part of, uh, of my job is, uh, is teaching about wildlife, um, and again, particularly birds, uh, but native plants, um, caterpillars, uh, butterflies, moths, all those good things, uh, snakes. But um, South Carolina Wildlife Federation has been around for uh, almost 90 years. Uh, next year is our 90th anniversary. So we were hoping to have this big, you know, party and celebration. Um, I, I don't know how that's going to look next year. Um, <laughs> we're probably all going to look like this wood duck, right, with, uh, with the crazy hairdo, this male wood duck here, uh, still in 2021. <laughs> um, oh, we, can have a, we can have a virtual birthday party. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, let, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, and uh, so, you know, we were started by hunters and fishermen, um, and now we still are supported by hunters and fishermen, and we support them. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of nature enthusiasts, um, it, it, every, every kind of type. You know, it doesn't matter if they're, they're hikers or if they're birders um, or, you know, people that go out um, and go snake, snake or looking for snakes. Um, but we have classes on uh, spiders. We have classes on dragonflies, snakes. Um, Birds, uh, you know, we're hoping to have some pretty soon on alligators um, and I don't know, probably anything else that you can think of. We had some on bees this year. We had some on oysters. Uh, so uh, we, we try to hit it all. Um, and we've reached, uh, I think, almost 3,500 people so far, um, if not more, um, since, since COVID. So, you know, the silver lining for us is the ability to reach, uh, you know, even more people through our virtual classes, which, uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't really exploring before. So um, I do miss uh, teaching people in, in person and taking people out and, and seeing, seeing them go, whoa, whenever they see something uh, uh, beautiful or, you know, like yesterday, you know, we were installing some. Uh, screech owl boxes and uh, we saw you know probably about a 20 pound um, snapping turtle right right by us um, and <laughs> you know uh, it's always fun to see adults uh, you know act like children again because they get so excited about this wildlife um, so today we're going to be talking about <clears throat> um, how you you know in in your in your yard um, you can uh, in, enhance it for for wildlife um, I'll be talking about you know some snakes I'll be talking about butterflies moths and uh, and birds again um, and uh, we'll focus on, uh, you know, sustainable garden gardening. Um, we'll we'll talk about um, providing food, uh, shelter, cover um, for not only birds but 
for uh, for all the wildlife. Um, and we do on October 7th, we have this great class that's being taught by Eric Sheely from the Riverbank Zoo Botanical Garden. Um, he's going to teach you how to, um, you know, manipulate your 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 property um, and your gardens, I guess, uh, and your soil uh, in each in each season. So you have fall, <clears throat> you know, winter, spring, summer. Uh, each season brings its own challenges, right? So he's gonna kind of walk you through through it and give you tips on on how to make your garden better um, through enhancing it with native plants um, and uh, amending the soil uh, throughout the year. So uh, you know if you're interested in that, uh, October seventh. Um, and my email address is j so j a y uh, at s c w f dot org so j a y at s e w f dot o r g if you're if you're interested in, in in any of the classes that we have coming up um, or if you just have any questions uh, but this picture right here is of, of a wood duck a uh, nice male wood duck um, and it's uh, by a photographer Vance Solseth he uh, he taught a photography class for us earlier this year that was really popular but uh, most of the pictures in here are, are from Vance and uh, uh, another fellow Zach Steinhauser uh, great conservationists uh, great wildlife lovers here in the Lexington uh, Midlands area um, so we'll go ahead and and get get going here uh, so I love the idea of bringing nature closer to you. Uh, just look at <laughs> uh, just a, a few of the animals that are out there in your yard. Um, you know, I live in Chapin uh, and, you know, we're lucky enough to have uh, woods still, right? We're not, we're developing um, and we're devel developed a little bit, but we still have, you know, nice green areas around. So, you know, this barred owl on the left-hand side, we've seen that and heard that plenty of times in our yard. Um, we have a screech owl box and we've had screech owls in our box uh, two out of the last four years and we also have great horned owls. Uh, so real, real treat to have those. Um, but we also have the smaller things uh, like this uh, green lynx spider right here. Um, and that's a picture I think by Vance again. Uh, and think about spiders as, as food. Um, you know, watch a bluebird, watch an eastern bluebird feed. Um, and they are, if you, if you have a good uh, pair of binoculars or a telephoto lens on your camera, you'll see their mouth, uh, their bill, you know, filled with spiders um, and, other, and other things as well, other insects and uh, arachnids. But, um, you know, spiders are food for a lot of things, even though they have eight legs and they're a little scary. They scare me. Um, you know, they are food for, for a lot of wildlife. And then you have this beautiful um, eastern king snake right here that was in our yard. Uh, earlier this summer. Um, and you, you think about king snakes, you think about them uh, consuming other snakes, they're constrictors, they eat other things as well. Um, but, you know, they, they can eat copperheads and, and rattlesnakes. Um, so, you know, they're, they're fantastic to have uh, on, on your property. Um, and I just kind of dotted this presentation with a, with a couple of quotes, but I, I took a walk in the woods and came out taller than the trees. Uh, how, about, how about that? I'm sure, I'm sure a number of us have, have experienced that. Um, wildlife needs your needs our help. Um, you know, uh, a lot of species are in decline. Um, birds are in decline. Um, you know, you think about amphibians uh, in decline. Um, reptiles in decline. A lot of it is just from uh, development, um, habitat loss. Right. Uh, there's there's definitely invasive invasive uh, plants and animals that impact our native wildlife negatively. Um, but, you know, the number one probably um, uh, a challenge for wildlife is uh, loss of habitat. So, you know, with, for example, in Chapin, I, I live behind a, a large subdivision um, and there's probably, you know, two, 250 homes there. Uh, imagine if if all of their yards, you know, looked looked like a wildlife habitat. Um, you know, the problem is they, they don't. It's a lot of turf grass. So, you know, what we try to encourage is uh, is creating habitat, no matter if you have a, a tenth of an acre or 100 acres um, on your property. So you can certify your garden or your yard as a, a wildlife habitat with the National Wildlife Federation, who's the parent um, company of, of uh, the South Carolina Wildlife uh, Federation. Um, and you have to provide food for wildlife. You have to provide cover. Um, so think about cover as, uh, you know, if, if you had an Eastern red cedar, or if you don't plant one or plant an American holly, uh, you know, certain, certain trees and shrubs can act as cover for wildlife. Uh, you know, Zach Steinhauser also makes, uh, has these things called toughy tubes, um, 
and he has funky little designs on the outside of them now. And uh, they they provide shelter for um, frogs such as this this green tree frog. Um, and I've, I've I think we have four or five around our prairie area in our house. And uh, you know I rem I think we had three or four uh, filled with uh, frogs one. Uh, um, uh, day, I think this past spring. So they work. It's a, it's a form of conservation, right? Um, make sure you have a place to raise young. Uh, so, you know, the easiest thing to do is, is just uh, build a bird box or, or buy a bird box. Um, and if you're looking for one, <laughs> we sell them. Uh, sustainable gardening. So this is a, uh, you know, a, a water basin that catches the water from the roof. And then you can, you know, hook up a, uh, a hose to that and water your garden. Um, but think about reducing pesticides. Um, think about reducing or eliminating, you know, herbicides. Um, you know, that's sustain sustainable gardening as well. You know, what are you doing with your leaves during the fall time? Are you, you know, um, just, just throwing those away? Um, or are you putting those uh, somewhere in your yard? Um, they are super important for wildlife. Uh, you look at um, animals foraging in leaf litter, there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of insects there. Um, and there are a lot of insects in the leaf litter uh, during the winter time. So a lot of animals can, can find food in that leaf litter. So we always say, leave the leaves um, if you can. Uh, it's, it's great for wildlife. Uh, provide water. If you don't have a water source, uh, provide water. Um, and if you can get that water moving a little bit, whether with, you know, a little uh, a vibration or, you know, they make these solar panel uh, uh, little uh, fountains now, uh, you'll have even more action in, in terms of birds coming to your to your um, bird bath uh, than if you didn't have uh, any motion in it. Uh, but food, you know, you think about food, most people think about um bird feeders right uh, but you can see this lantana which is a which is the foreign plant you know it's not native to the united states um that's food right uh it's one of my favorite plants again even though it's not native um because it it, it attracts so uh many moths and butterflies so if i'm a uh if i want to connect somebody to nature i take them over to my lantana plants at my house and show them all these beautiful uh insects that are around it um, and then, then it opens my, the conversation up to, to native plants and why those are so important, which we'll get to in a little bit. But you can go to uh, National Wildlife Federation and certify your yard. Um, and for each yard that's certified in South Carolina, we, we uh, actually receive $5 from them. Um, but it's a, it's a great thing to do. It's a great thing to get your neighbors uh, involved with. And, uh, you know, hopefully in, the, in, the, in 2021, we'll actually get um, all of Chapin certified as a community habitat. Last year, we certified um, Columbia. And there's probably seven or eight other towns or cities in uh, South Carolina that have been certified, but I think it would be a nice feather in Chapin's cap to get to get to be certified um, with the National Wildlife Federation, showing that are we you, care. Are you, are you up for some questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, so you talk about the certified um, areas, and so it kind of brought up. Um, do you have anything to say about sort of invasive pets or nuisance pets or, you know, you, you're trying to bring in animals and then, you know, one of the reasons we struggle with having birds is, you know, neighborhood cats or we see other animals in the yard and yeah. um, is there yeah. anything you can address there? Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's so much to address. We can have a, <laughs> another PowerPoint presentation on that. But, you know, you think about cats, um, you know, and, and I know there's cat lovers out there that are just like, oh, let's let's let leave the cats outside. I, uh, they, I have three. I love them. They're all inside. They will uh, never we be love, outside. We love people like you, Amanda. Seriously, like, you know, uh, way, way to go. But, uh, you know, cats kill billions with a B. OK, so we're talking about thousands of millions of animals each year. Um, the American Birding Association, I, I think they worked with Audubon on this, uh, maybe by themselves, but they estimate it, there's some disparity, you know, between the numbers. But um, anywhere, I think from two to four billion birds are killed each year by uh, domestic cats that are outside. Um, and these cats don't need food for the most part. You know, they're, they're being fed. They're, their owners just like to keep them outside, um, you know, to give them a little bit of freedom. Cats weren't here. You know, domesticated cats weren't here, obviously, but before Europeans were, um, you know, we have lynx and bobcat and uh, some some, you know, bigger ones um, as well. You know, think about mountain lions. But, you know, these domestic uh, cats uh, are are, <laughs> are really horrible for for wildlife. <clears throat> um, I mean, you know, we had one growing up that was outside. I grew up on the south side of Lake Murray and 
uh, it would drag snakes in, it would drag mammals in, it even dragged a copperhead in once. You know, cats are, are great, great predators. They have uh, fantastic reflexes and they're, and they're uh, beautiful hunters. Uh, the problem is um, they, they shouldn't be outside hunting, you know, all across the, the world, really, um, but in our country. So, you know, cats are a problem. Um, you know, we have dogs. We, we well, we have one dog. Um, and, uh, you know, we keep them on the leash now um, just because, you know, 10 years ago is when I started this journey of, uh, you know, uh, be, being a naturalist uh, whenever I saw a or when I saw a uh, Baltimore Oriole when I was living in, in Pittsburgh. It totally changed my life. And beforehand, if somebody would have told me to keep my dog on the leash, I would have said, why in the world do I need to do that? Oh, these birds, you know, but then all of a sudden I'm learning about all these challenges birds have. I fell in love with birds, so I want to take care of them now. Um, and, you know, even dogs, uh, they, they might not be as destructive as, as cats, but, you know, they, they have a great nose, they can find things, they can sniff things out, um, and they can disrupt a lot of these ground dwelling birds, you know, think about that leaf litter, a lot of um, moths, uh, you know, a lot of the caterpillars, um, you know, will pupate in the leaf litter, and if dogs running all over it, and um, uh, it, it can cause a lot of damage to these, so we, we've, we have an insect uh, decline even. <laughs> uh, I remember I remember washing my mom and dad's car all the time uh, and getting the insects off. Uh, when's the last time you've had to do that? Um, it's been a while probably. Um, and why is that? You know, think about these pesticides. Uh, think about all these invasive species that are out there kind of disrupting things. Um, but this is going to be a positive uh, <laughs> webinar <laughs> class. But, um, you know, there's there's things to do, though. There's work to be to, to be done. Um, and there's there's other things, you know, invasive uh, plant species that are disrupting ecosystems. You know, you think about Florida. Florida has problems with all sorts of things. They even have a python that's, you know, that can eat alligators there, you know, young ones, but um, still alligators, you know, uh, they don't have too, too many predators, but this one python that's kind of, um, you know, become a problem in, in Florida um, is is really wreaking havoc over there and, and become an apex predator. Um, that's From what I've heard, there are no more rabbits, like there's no more rabbits in the Everglades. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so and, and rabbits are, are great at breeding, right? <laughs> so there there should be, uh, but you know the, the the snakes cause a lot of problems. It's it's out of balance there, um, you know. But what is what does your neighborhood look like? You know, at least the neighborhood on the right hand side does have some trees, which is nice. But look at all that turf grass. Um, you know, what if what if this neighborhood here on the top left looked like, or that house right there looked like the one on the bottom left? Um, you know, that neighborhood that is behind us, you know, that the, the top left is what every yard almost looks like. Um, and when you think about that, it's just one plant. It's turf grass, whatever that, that might be, um, you know, centipede or zoysia or, or whatever. But it's one one grass. So it creates a monoculture, just one type of plant, uh, which is horrible for uh, wildlife. But what, are, what what else are you doing to make it look this beautiful? I mean, that is beautiful grass, right? Uh, what kind of pesticides? I don't see one. I don't see one weed in there. Um, so what kind of herbicides are you putting in? Where is that stuff going whenever it rains? Um, how has wildlife been disrupted? Um, because it is a, a short turf grass. Um, but you think about this one down in the bottom left, you know, I remember one, one person's, I, I used to ask the question, how do these pictures make you feel? And, uh, you know, obviously people would say, you know, not too great on the one on the top left, but, um, uh, or, or which one would you rather live at if you were a bird? Everybody would say the bottom left. And uh, this one lady said, well, I would I would like to live there. And I said, why? She said, because it makes me feel warm inside. And that's true. You know, you look at the one on the top left and a lot of people like that. Right. Um, but it's just kind of uh, sanitized. Uh, you look at the one in the bottom left and, and it makes you feel something right uh, that the one on the top left does not. Um, but you look at all those layers, uh, you, you see the turf grass there a little bit, right, in the form of a trail. And I, I play baseball, my, my uh, boys play baseball. I can't, you know, hit a ball through, you know, this, these tall weeds. So I do have some turf, turf grass. I'm not anti-turf grass. Um, but we do have a lot of tall, tall, tall grasses, tall perennials, um, you know, around our property. Uh, but you, you see this short grass, you know, that's, that's a foraging opportunity for bluebirds. Um, for northern flickers, the type of woodpecker that actually you find on the ground a lot. 
um, for other things as well. But then you have this other grass and you might find some blue grosbeaks, some indigo buntings, you know, these other birds that like these weedy areas. And then you have some nice shrubs and then you have medium trees and then you have tall trees. Each different layer supports different animals. Uh, so, you know, when we're th thinking about this one layer that's probably just beat down with pesticides and herbicides, it is supporting hardly anything. Um, so, you know, imagine this neighborhood on the right hand side with yards like this. And boy, my dream, you know, is is to get the to get the United States like that. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to be able to do that or we're not going to be able to, as an organization to do that by, by ourselves. But, you know, maybe we can get, um, you know, towns to do it. Um, maybe we can get, you know, just little neighborhoods to do that. You know, you have to start small, but uh, wildlife is hurting and um, it, it needs our help. And, and it can be as simple as providing habitat in your own backyard. So this is one of my favorite uh, pictures that I've uh, began, I probably began using uh, uh, a month and a half ago, but this is Eric Sheely's place. And um, he's the one that's teaching our class on October 7th. And this is the house that he bought a few years ago. And he had a couple camellia trees in there, not from the United States. Uh, this rose bush thingy <laughs> here, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty sparse and maybe some mums or something. And look at all that turf grass, uh, just kind of looks dead, right? And three years later, this is what it looks like now. Um, and to, you know, I was talking to him about him. I said, man, it looks like a, like, a, like an English cottage. And he said, yeah, he said, let's stop thinking of it like that though. He said, let's start thinking of it as the new Southern Southeastern cottage, you know, a South Carolina cottage. Um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine an, an HOA in, in South Carolina being upset uh, with with the way that this looks, right? Look how beautiful that is. And he gardens with about 70% uh, native species, okay? So our, so our um, insects have evolved with those species. So um, if it's an insect that eats plants, you know, they can digest those chemical components of those native species. You know, when you start introducing things that are not from here, most of our insects can't eat it. So all of a sudden you have a desert. You have pretty flowers and that's great for, for us, right? Uh, but all of a sudden you have a desert um, for uh, for wildlife. Um, so incorporate, you know, more natives than non-native species and, and always uh, avoid invasives. And invasives are just, you know, foreign species that we've introduced that, that take over ecosystems. Um, you know, like Nandina, um, you know, is, is one Chinese privet, which is a giant problem. Um, you know, the butterfly bush out west, um, I think in California is a big problem for them. So far, uh, I think on the east, it, it hasn't been a problem. Um, but this is a big thing. Look at this quote, to forget how to dig the earth and tend the soil is to forget ourselves, that you, we're a part of this stuff. Um, you know, think about the, the elements and, and the, the minerals that we have, you know, in us. You know, it's, it's the same. A lot of them are the same minerals that are in the dirt. And I, I think this, it's a connection that we're, um, we're breaking right now. Uh, you know, I'm 41, I have two kids and people my age, the adults, you know, they're busy taking their kids all over the place. Uh, you know, piano lessons, uh, baseball, football, um, you know, soccer. Uh, and I know with COVID, things are a little bit weird, but, um, you know, they're, they're not interested in, in anything outdoors or, or too much outdoors. They're definitely, uh, most of them, I, I can't remember the last time I've talked to somebody about gardening. <laughs> um, you know, so, I, you know, my, my goal is to get more people our age, um, you know, into, into the outdoors, uh, get their hands dirty a little bit. Look at, look at those plants, see what they can find, especially with their kids. You create a, a young conservationist like that. Um, so remember, food, water, a place to raise young, uh, provide cover and sustainable gardening practices. And, you know, I know in South Carolina, watering is a big issue because uh, it gets so hot, right? And he has this drip hose, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't spray. His, his water. He doesn't use a sprinkler because a ton of it evaporates. Um, it, 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 it evaporates a lot from, from just sitting on the leaves, right? Um, and then it just gets uh, water, pushed away by the wind as well. But, you know, when you have a drip line, um, it, it's, it's right there next to the, to the ground. It, almost all of it, you know, gets soaked up uh, by the ground and then goes into the, uh, into the um, plants there. So uh, think about, you know, something like that. That's a form of sustainable gardening practices. Um, we want to attract insects, uh, arachnids, and all of that, you know, is, is food. Uh, so I'm not a big spider guy. They kind of make me do this weird dance whenever I, I run into a, uh, <laughs> into a spider web. Um, but, 
you know, they are fantastic to have uh, around your property. And, you know, uh, the spiders are doing pretty well. Um, and uh, there are some gorgeous ones out there. Look at that green orb weaver, how beautiful that is. Um, and I think all three of these pictures are from Vance um, Solseth. Uh, you know, we have uh, thousands probably of beetles um, here in South Carolina. Some of them are in decline, like, like I think this is a, a stag beetle. Um, it might be a female, I could be wrong. But, um, you know, stag beetles are, are in decline, you know, because people uh, take, take these giant trees that should be decaying, uh, but they remove them because they don't look good. Well, I think a stag beetle, the larva needs about five years, if I'm not mistaken, um, to mature. Uh, so it needs a, a nice big, big tree to decompose. Uh, we have this milkweed assassin bug, just beautiful things that can be found if, if you look closely enough in your garden um, and if you plant for, for these types of things. So, you know, there, there's seriously just hundreds of things that you could plant on, on your property. Uh, these are some of my favorite ones. Uh, goldenrod is fantastic. Joe pie weed. Um, and I think we need to change some of these uh, <laughs> some of these names. I, I would imagine a lot of people would be scared to plant something that had weed in it, you know, um, like uh, milkweed. You know, it sounds scary. People are thinking that they're planting dandelions. Um, you know, I, as somebody said, I think Douglas Ptolemy is an entomologist, so a bug guy. He said we should call uh, milkweed uh, butterflies delight. You know, that's what we should re rename it. Um, how, how many more would we would we sell? You know, if it was renamed. But Joe Pie Weed, you know, is is a fantastic pollinator uh, attractor. So you'll see a bunch of butterflies on it in the daytime. Um, but it's also a host plant, right? So remember. Um, caterpillars are emuls and butterflies before they're moths and butterflies, right? And they need to eat leaves. So if you, instead of have Joe Pie weed, you have something like Nandina that's not from here, uh, guess what? You're taking the food away from um, essentially, you know, uh, moth and butterfly babies, right? <laughs> the caterpillars. Um, and I want to say Joe Pie weed is a host plant to around 40 or 50 species of moths and butterflies, goldenrod which isn't a plant that everybody's allergic to. That's ragweed that blooms at the same time. Uh, goldenrod is a host plant to, I think, over 100 different types of moths and butterflies. Same thing with uh, aster. There's a bunch of different aster species. But even this uh, little little plant right here, common violet, that's a nice host plant to, to several species of moths and butterflies. And here's just a, just a handful of uh, the moths and butterflies that we have. Uh, we have a luna moth, uh, one of my favorite trees. And we have a, a few of them, but one of my favorite trees is a big, huge sweet gum on the side of our driveway coming coming uh, to our house. And our builder wanted to cut it down. Um, and he probably asked me three times if, if he could cut the tree down. And I, I told him very nicely, he was a nice guy, uh, to not mess with the tree. <laughs> that, that tree was important for wildlife. And it's probably on my property, the number two bird producing tree on my property, but it also is the host plant to that, that beautiful luna moth. So the luna moth mother, right, uh, knows that her babies can, can eat those leaves. So she'll lay her egg on the underside usually of those leaves, and then the caterpillar hatches and it starts munching. Um, if you had a, you know, a Bradford pear from Asia, uh, you wouldn't probably have the luna moth. Um, it might be a host plant to one or two species. I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, you think about these sweet gums, um, hickories, maples, uh, oaks that we have. Uh, we're talking about several hundred different species of moths and caterpillars that are being <clears throat> supported by all those, all those uh, different, different types of trees. Um, and remember the perennials and bushes also, um, shrubs uh, support them as well. Uh, so uh, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail is our state, state butterfly. Tulip poplar is one of um, its host plants. Black cherry is another one. Uh, zebra swallowtail, look at this. Uh, isn't it gorgeous? The, the black and white, obviously, um, uh, butterfly that we have there. And it's actually, it looks like it's feeding on some uh, uh, nectar from milkweed right there, butterfly weed, I think. Um, but its host plant is pawpaw. Um, and you can find a lot of that in Saluda Shoals, uh, some other places around the Midlands. Uh, monarch, obviously, is, is the host plant is milkweed. Uh, monarchs have declined about 90% in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and uh, so if you plant some milkweed, you can, you can really help that species out. And then you have passion flower vine, uh, one of the prettiest flowers, I think, on the, on the planet. And it grows, you know, naturally, um, you know, right here in, in the southeast. Um, and that host plant is, uh, well, it's a host plant to gulf fritillaries, uh, var variegated fritillaries, and, and other species of, of moths and butterflies. Um, so that's that's just scratching the surface, y'all. Um, you know, there's way more options than, than just those, you know, five uh, for, for um, 
are pollinators. And before they're moths and butterflies, they're caterpillars, right? So we talked about this a little bit. But look at these guys. We, in the last um, two weeks, my family and I, so our two, my two boys and my wife, we found 19 different new, new species of uh, caterpillars in our yard. Uh, fall time and springtime are great times to get outside and look for caterpillars. Um, I always use the general uh, rule of if it's hairy, it's scary, um, whether that's a plant or an animal so or, or a caterpillar. So if it's hairy, I typically try to leave those alone. Um, there's there's some malls, uh, 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 caterpillars out there that can that can kind of uh, be painful if you if you touch them. So uh, just don't touch it um, if you don't know what it is. But look at these; they're they're interesting looking. Uh, you you think about this spiny rose caterpillar here, um, and the moth is actually beautiful too. But look at this thing; it looks like a little jewel. Uh, you know, just just on I think that was on river birch, uh, which is one of the best host host plant trees out there for for uh, these guys, um, possibly a unicorn prominent or a morning glory prominent. Um, the the caterpillar is way more interesting than the moth. It looks like a a, a dead you know portion of the leaf right there. Uh, some fuzzy guys. I'm not a caterpillar uh, person, so I don't know all of these. Uh, monarch butterfly or caterpillar right here. Gulf fritillary. It looks scary, but it's harmless. Probably a sulfur right here. Um, and maybe some uh, Datanas right here, uh, but I could be wrong there. But uh, this is a nice pipe vine swallowtail. So <clears throat> this was on a birding trip last year at the Botanical, South Carolina Botanical Gardens in Clemson, and the birding was kind of slow, so we started looking for caterpillars, and look what we found, and that was probably within an hour, hour and a half. But these are the guys that we were looking for, and those, and these, you know, birds are looking for things like this, right? So I'm a bird guy. I, I love birds. I lead bird walks and um, I, I love how they sound. I, I love how beautiful they are. But look at this color right here. And every single one of these birds, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at them. Every single one of these birds have been in my yard in Chapin. OK, I think we're up to around 108, 109 species that have been in our yard in Chapin. So, you know, if you plant for wildlife, the wildlife is going to come. Um, but you have to know what's out there. You have to know what to listen for, uh, for. So I always tell people, you know, if there's a bird 200 yards to my right, um, I'll never see that probably. But if it's if it's singing, I can hear it. Right. So, you know, you take this black Bernie and warbler, super high pitched sound uh, song that it has. If, if I've never seen one before, but I know its song and I hear it, you know, 150 yards that way, and guess where I'm going? I'm going to go find it over there. So, you know, you'll you'll see more birds in your yard if you if you learn their their songs. But uh, all of these birds, you know, pass pass through the Midlands. Uh, some of them breed here. Uh, some of them continue on um, during migration to, to more northern, you know, uh, breeding breeding lands. Um, but these are just some uh, some more plants that that I would recommend. You know, um, some of our native viburnum here, uh, spice bush. Uh, there's a butterfly called the spice bush swallowtail. Um, this fall, this indigo here, and native blueberries. Native blueberries are fantastic. So uh, we have about 17 plants. You know, on our property, we have a few acres. But um, if you if you have room for a blueberry, it's one of my favorite plants to uh, to install in in a uh, in a yard uh, for wildlife. And and you obviously get the benefit of uh of having blueberries too so if you've never tried a blueberry and peach pie you know try it it's delicious <laughs> um you know wide-eyed vireo uh right here prothonotary warbler um uh, magnolia warbler baltimore oriole american red star black burnian warbler black throated blue warbler black and white warbler yellow bill cuckoo all these birds are right here um and they're not here you know for the entire year these are called neotropical migrants uh so a lot of birds are going to come up to south carolina and beyond uh, for the breeding um, season, and then they'll they'll head back down south uh, to South America, Central America, or Mexico um, uh, for for the winter. Um, so some cover and food. What what can you provide? Uh, American holly is fantastic. I think I mentioned that before. Uh, not only does it provide these these berries that uh, birds uh, and other wildlife can eat, but look at all that cover. You know. Um, they maintain, you know, they don't lose all their leaves at one at once. So they maintain, you know, a pretty consistent um, foliage cover throughout the year. Uh, it's also you you think about those those holly leaves, you know, how how hard they are and how spiny they are. There's actually, you know, a caterpillar that eats them, uh, Henry Henry's Elfin caterpillar, and it's it's for a small butterfly. Uh, American beautyberry, uh, y'all might this might be um, familiar to many of you, you guys. Um, there's a there's one from Asia, and we don't we don't want to plant that one, but we want to stick with the American beautyberry. Uh, but a lot of these birds. 
birds uh, come through here um, and, and eat that. Uh, a lot of our thrush, so wood thrush, um, Swainson's thrush, gray cheek thrush, will we'll eat those now during migration. I've actually seen this bird um, a couple times, black-throated blue warbler, uh, eat some of these berries. Uh, but most birds, you know, they're going to mix that uh, berry and seed um, diet with, uh, with insects because insects pack a lot of protein, a lot of nutrition, and, and fat. Uh, blackberry is also a great plant. So a lot of a lot of food there in the berries, um, a lot of nutrition there, and look at all that cover. You know, so if I'm a bird and there's a there's a snake around, you know, I might seek cover in there. If there's a hawk that's trying to get me, you know, I can I can dive in there and and be relatively safe. So water water features. Um, you know, these this is what you typically see, right? uh bird baths um if you have finan fa financial resources that are that are pretty good <laughs> um you can uh do something like this you know that's that's really nice and you have that moving water you have that sound it's going to attract even even more birds but you know you'll get frogs you'll get certain types of snakes um that are coming that will come to your yard for a drink and, and that's okay attracting snakes is okay um you know think about snakes as bird food Think about them as food for possum. Think about them as food for, you know, skunks and raccoons. Uh, you, you, you see an adult snake. Um, for every adult snake you, you, you see, there are, you know, many, many, many other snakes that, that did not make it to, to that adult stage. Many of them are, are eaten, actually. <clears throat> so uh, shallow water dishes, you know, you can always place those out as well, not just the, the tall ones for the birds, uh, but shallow water dishes are, are great. Um, this is a red-shouldered hawk that I, that I photographed. It was eating a frog. So, you know, we, we want a healthy frog habitat on, your, on, on the properties. Um, and you do that by providing, you know, cover and, and plenty of food for them. And remember, I said, leave the leaves before, you know, you think about the screech owl, which is the screech owl that, that's been in our, our box two out of the four years. Um, you know, they eat a lot of earthworms, actually. They'll eat birds, they'll eat bats, they'll eat little mammals, um, you know, probably some reptiles. <clears throat> if they can find a frog, you know, uh, they'll, they'll probably take that as well. But they actually eat a lot of earthworms. So, you know, when I'm thinking about earthworms, uh, if I'm going to take my boys fishing or something, move some leaves around and, and voila, you have, have worms. So, you know, think about leaving your leaves, um, you know, for wildlife. It'll help help out on your property. Uh, cover and places to raise young. We talked about a little bit of that already um, through trees, but who's going to create a brush pile? You know, we have about five or six, I think, on our property, um, but we do have, you know, three acres, um, and these are just a couple of them, but um, what, do, what do people think of whenever they, they think of brush piles, um, and why is it that people are scared to death of brush piles? You know, it's, it's because of, of these guys right here, snakes. Um, and so right here we have a juvenile eastern rat snake, um, which is non-venomous. And then again, we have the uh, eastern king snake. Uh, and this one, again, will will eat other snakes, including venomous species. Uh, this one is a great, great uh, mammal predator. Uh, so, you know, and, and bird. It, it can climb trees. It can climb, you know, brick buildings, uh, poles. Uh, all sorts of things. And it actually gets pretty darn big. It can get to six or seven feet. Um, you know, probably the biggest one I've seen is probably, you know, between five and six feet, but uh, they can get really big and people are intimidated by them. But we have around 40, 45 species of, of snakes here in South Carolina. Only six of them are venomous. Um, we look for venomous species uh, on our property and we've we found one copperhead about 50 yards down the road and, and that's it we've had about eight species of snakes on our property all of them so far have been non-venomous um but uh you know when you when you think about the the brush piles um you know you, you always find these weird little tunnels and and ca ca you know cavernous little, little openings and and what's in there you know maybe an armadillo now right uh but you know, maybe an opossum maybe a skunk um, you know, maybe maybe a eastern box turtle, which is in decline, actually. <clears throat> um, but, you know, we find uh, birds around them. I've had three different types of wren. This is a Carolina wren up here. Um, but we've also had winter wren and, and house wren bouncing around them. Dark eyed juncos, which is a type of bird, a flock of them. Uh, deer, you know, all sorts of things seeking cover in or around those brush piles. Um, and if you have an area that you can kind of keep bare um, where it's just kind of dirt exposed, you know, bees will, will uh, probably end up finding that area and it might be a solitary bee or a wasp or, you know, you might have a whole colony. Uh, and I don't know if y'all can see these holes, but this the, each each one, you know, um, has a, a bee going in and out. 
uh, and that happens each spring, uh, or it has happened each spring for the last five five years that we've been here, five or six years. So provide cover, uh, logs and rocks, right? Again, you know, people think about snakes, but you know, these logs decompose. And if you move one, um, you know, that's connect or uh, touching the ground, a lot of times you'll see this white grub looking thing, right? It kind of looks nasty, but that'll eventually, most of them will eventually turn into a really cool beetle. So you have a Triceratops beetle right here. You have a Eastern Hercules beetle, and this is a beautiful stag beetle, a male that that I found in Casey uh, during a during a bird walk that I led uh, near the Congaree River. So look at that, and it's a big <laughs> it's a big beetle, but it's one of the prettiest animals out there, um, and that's because you know it has plenty of decomposing um, uh, logs uh, in this one area. It's a it's a park called Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve. Um, so, you know, have some log piles. Uh, you'll, you'll see more toads, frogs, and, and snakes. Uh, think, about, think about installing a rock pile. Uh, and, learn, and learn your snakes. Um, you know, I see too many pictures of, of people holding dead snakes, um, and it's because they're, they're scared, right? They're, they, they have a fear. Um, there's a great website to go to, and you can pretty much find almost every, every single uh, South Carolina snake on it and learn something about it. But, but remember, we only have uh, six species of venomous uh, snakes here in, in South Carolina. Um, I was actually being interviewed today and about three feet from the guy's foot, you know, was a water moccasin um, when, when he was interviewing me. So we just moved spots and, and everybody was OK. Um, and uh, here's a so that's a water moccasin. Right. And you, you see the, these beautiful lines right here. Um, they, they have these eye patches um, and then this coloration. Uh, a lot of water snakes can can look like that. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, kill water snakes because they think they are water moccasins. Um, but very rarely, you know, especially around Lake Murray, I, I think DNR has never really recorded a water moccasin on Lake Murray. But if you ask, you know, your neighbor on Lake Murray, uh, he'll probably say, Hey, he's killed a, a few water moccasins this year, right. Or last year. And, uh, it's just not true. Um, why are snakes important? Um, think about think about um, all the mammals they eat. What do mammals have? They they have ticks, right? Um, so you know, I think the number two tick um, consumer in in the state is a timber rattlesnake. The number one is a possum. Uh, they have a lot of dexterity, a lot of control in in their fingertips, and they can you know they're very good groomers. So opossums uh, are great tick uh, consumers. But uh, the number two tick uh, uh, controller, I guess, in, in South Carolina is, is a timber rattlesnake. Um, they eat hundreds, if if not just a little over a thousand per year through the through the uh, mammals that they eat. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, corn snake, red rat snake. Um, you know, it's non-venomous, beautiful, beautiful species that you want around. Uh, but somebody sent me this picture and she said that a truck came by uh, on the road, uh, pulled over, killed that snake and uh, uh, said he, uh, it was a copperhead. So uh, people just, you know, there's a lot of people that that don't know their snakes and all they have to do is take a little bit of time and, and learn them. And, uh, you know, a lot of these snakes will survive. So um, I love this quote uh, from this from this conservationist and part of its blog. But in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will un only understand what we are taught. I, I just absolutely love um, that quote. I couldn't agree with it anymore you think about the snake that i was just talking about if, if the fellow would have would have just uh just learned his snakes um you know uh maybe he wouldn't have that fear he definitely would have known that that uh red rat snake or or corn snake um you know wasn't a, a copperhead um but even more maybe he would have fallen in love with that snake and he would actually promote the um you know that that snake, and instead of um, you know try to try to harm the snake. So you know we we want to make people or help people fall in love with nature. This is my my son. You know looking at that uh, leopard frog uh, tree frog, um, and I mean the the boys just love it. Uh, this is this is a, a group on the left hand side. Um, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, a book book club, right? 
and uh, they wanted to learn more about nature. Uh, so we had something kind of fun called conservation and cocktails. So we, we passed, uh, everybody passed some wine around. They listened to me talk about nature and they bought some bird houses. They bought some bird friendly coffee, shade grown coffee, and uh, you know, got, got a little bit closer to nature through, through a nice simple talk uh, in a nice fun social setting, setting with friends. We have tons of classes, master naturalist, pro birder, uh, we go into schools, or we were, we, we were going into schools. My goal this year was to see about 2,000 kids, but we had to, we had to, uh, you know, put, put a hold on that, but maybe we can do it virtually and to, until it's safe to do so. Um, and then we have this really popular outdoor women's retreat um, where, you know, a couple hundred women come, learn how to shoot guns, arrows, learn, I, I'm, I'm there to, to take them birding, um, learn how to tie knots, uh, kayak. Um, all, all sorts of things. There's so many activities. So, you know, we want to uh, just open uh, South Carolinians' eyes up to all this nature, not just birds, not just snakes, not just, you know, deer, but all of nature um, uh, in, every, in every way, you know, uh, possible. Because uh, if, if they fall in love with it, they learn, they learn about it, they, they could fall in love with it. And if they fall in love with it, they're going to take care of it, right? And so my last slide here, you know, um, Amanda was asking about cats um, and there's there's a, you know, a little little blur, but I already hit that a little bit. But think about window strikes. Um, you know, that I say hundreds of, of millions of birds are thought to die uh, due to window strikes uh, based on this 2014 study. It's it's close to around a, a, a billion birds. So think about 600 million, 700 million birds. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's some give and take there with that number. Um, habitat loss and fragmentation is probably the, the number one uh, driver of, of um, the decline for wildlife. Um, and there's some issues with, with you know, climate change. Um, you know, some of these birds come up at certain times and if it's warmer earlier, uh, it can impact their food source. Um, and if the food source has already come and gone by the time they get there or if they're too early, um, that can cause problems with uh, certain bird species, and there's and there's other uh, things obviously with with other types of, of wildlife. But create backyards, uh, focus on native plants, less mowed lawn, y'all, um, and uh, think about a brush pile. Uh, leave portions of your yard untouched. Install next nest boxes, and again, we can help you with that. Um, and a water source. Uh, Carolina fence gardens are great. They incorporate all sorts of historical. Um, uh, things uh, from South Carolina. Um, I, I like to see them at schoolyards or libraries or, or churches, um, and they're easy to install. And you know, our public schools, you know, lack money sometimes. So if if you're wanting to install a garden at one of your your public schools in your town, just just let me know, and I can help you out with that. Um, talk about nature and conservation with friends and, and family, and and I always just say, remember to be kind. Uh, um, you know. Uh, honey attracts more flies, right? Or sugar or whatever the, the, the saying is. Um, you know, a lot of people get so frustrated because they, they see all this development and all this decline in wildlife and they just get so frustrated, they almost get angry. So uh, let's keep it positive and spread the love of nature, right? Um, and read, read Bringing ho uh, Nature Home. I read it twice, right? Um, and uh, it's by, a, it's by a, a entomologist, Douglas Ptolemy. I think I mentioned him earlier. Um, and he's, he came out with a, another book this past year um, called Nature's Best Hope, but it talks about, it really focuses on planting natives uh, um, and, and what species they, they support in terms of uh, caterpillars. Uh, really fascinating book. I think if you read it, uh, you'll, you'll never uh, garden the same way. And, uh, you know, these are just some more birds um, and, and one garter snake right here, but some more birds that are, that are around uh, South Carolina. We started off with the wood duck here, but an indigo bunting, that was uh, the second bird that I saw in Pittsburgh whenever we lived there that um, kind of cement, cemented me into this whole bird and, and nature thing, right? I saw my Baltimore Oriole and then I saw the indigo bunting a couple weeks later and I, I was hooked. Uh, and rose-breasted grosbeak, a beautiful, beautiful bird um, that we get uh, through this area in the springtime and fall time. So, you know, I've talked about 45 minutes, I think now, <laughs> 50 minutes maybe, and uh, I'll, I'll, sh I'll shut it down now. But um, if you have any questions um, or if you ever want to email uh, me, again, uh, my uh, email address is j, so j-a-y at sc for South Carolina wf for wildlife federation dot org so jay at scwf dot org and i'd be happy to to answer any questions 
Thank you so much, Jay. I've learned a lot. I've written a lot of notes. Um, if anybody else has questions, you're welcome to either unmute yourself and ask, or uh, if you'd like to email or in the chat. And we do have some chat questions. And uh, one of them is one that I, I almost asked. Um, they were curious about the recent sightings about that tegu lizard that's been seen, that really big lizard, and if you knew yeah. anything more. Yeah, so DNR uh, is really concerned about it. Uh, I mean, we are we are too. But uh, you know, if you do see uh, one of those lizards, uh, don't don't call. I mean, you can't call us, but call South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, they'll probably send somebody out. Um, they they have the resources to to handle um, those types of things, um, and they have their scientists that are probably keeping up with the data uh, related to that. But yeah, they've been seen in Greenville. They've been seen in Lexington County. Um, you know, uh, and hopefully they'll get that under control. Um, but it's probably going to be a uh, continued battle because um, I think those things are being pushed up from from uh, further south. Um, so, you know, the, the, the southern states need to need to control those. We need to control ours. Uh, but hopefully it won't turn into a situation like the, uh, the, the python down there in Florida has, has turned out. Because you think about all of our ground uh, nesting and, and dwelling creatures that can be predated upon, you know, by this uh, by this kind of uncontested, you know, new predator out there. So hopefully uh, it'll be controlled. Um, but we'll we'll have to learn along with with you guys. But I, I think this past year or this year rather was the first time that we had we had heard about it. Okay. Someone else, or same person also wanted to know where they could get or how they could get the birds and bees coffee. Um, that you discussed and that we talked about earlier. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, we do have a coffee club um, and you can email me if you're, if you're interested. Our, our office is on St. Andrews Road. So about once a month, um, we make this uh, group purchase, right? Um, so uh, it, it just helps alleviate the, the shipping. So that the shipping is usually about $10. It doesn't matter if you buy a 12 ounce bag or a five pound bag. Um, but when you have, you know, 10, 20 people purchasing it, you know, that, that shipping fee gets, gets divided by that many people that order it. So, you know, we have this, uh, little coffee club and, um, you can either join the coffee club and, and, uh, just wait until we, we place an order, or you can go to our office right off of St. Andrews road and pick it up, uh, or you can just purchase it online or, or get your neighbor to drink it, um, or, or a few neighbors to drink it and create your own little coffee club and, and just order it, you know, once every month or so. Uh, I buy it in five pound bags because we have two kids and my wife and I need the, ca <laughs> the caffeine. Um, and that lasts us a good while. I can't taste the difference between my first cup and the, and the last cup. Um, and, uh, you know, that way I don't have to continue to order all the time. Uh, but yeah, a hundred percent of their beans are sourced from shade grown, uh, coffee plantation plantations. So, you know, that Baltimore Oriole, for instance, um, you know, has a place to winter, um, you know, uh, the, the, the five or six months that it's not here in the, the, the United States. Um, you know, uh, the American red start, this, this bird, give me just a second. Give me one second. You know, this bird right here, uh, their light roast is named after this one. So that's another bird that that winters in those, the Blackburnian warbler, the black and white warbler. Um, not so much this one, um, but the Baltimore Oriole. You know, a, a lot of these birds on this page, you know, seek seek um, or live out part of their lives, not only in those, you know, shade plantation um, uh farms but you know in, in natural forests that are occurring there but they, these uh, shade grown coffee farms are way better habitat than non you know or, or sun grown coffee so i appreciate appreciate your interest um you know please email me if you're if you uh, want to pursue it more uh but birds and bean you you can order it online you know just by yourself um or you can join the coffee club and uh you know enjoy that that um uh, reduced uh shipping shipping rate um, and then I, I had a question, um, maybe the last one, unless somebody, somebody else responds. Um, so we talked a lot about what residents can do in their own spaces. Um, but a lot of what I see are um, businesses or, I mean, I happen to be in a government building. How do we, you know, sort of leverage these ideas and try to get businesses and governments to make their own spaces? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, so, you know, I know the National Wildlife Federation is partnering with this huge national home builder. 
Um, and I think the end goal, you know, you, you see a lot of these uh, home developments, um, you know, take a piece of beautiful land, basically looks like it was napalm, you know, just every single tree is taken out. Um, and then they plant, you know, foreign species that shouldn't even be here. So I think, you know, the end goal for the National Wildlife Federation um, is going to try to get some of these home builders, um, you know, these giant home builders to start incorporating in their landscape uh, all native species. So imagine that, you know, you, you, you build a, I mean, I just left Aiken yesterday and it was a neighborhood of 2000 houses. Uh, imagine if, if every single house, um, you know, that was, that the property was cleared was uh, reestablished with native plants. Um, you know, think about that. Think about all the insects that are supported and then that supports everything else. Um, and, you know, giving the landscapers and the builders, um, you know, what a healthy uh, landscape for wildlife looks like and encourage them to, to uh, you know, plant for them. Um, you know, there's you know, a lot of people obviously don't want government to get too, too big, but, you know, there, there are policies that we probably need to see, you know, uh, uh, come through. Um, and uh, I, I love just encouraging people to do it themselves. Uh, it may, may be a little bit more idealistic, but um, I, I think if we come together as a group, you know, we can we can make real change uh, with without you know um, maybe somebody telling us what to do. Um, but uh, you know, in, in the form of uh, having towns and, and cities to change, uh, one of our goals, hopefully, at some point, is. Um, when a tree is is uh, falls down in Colombia, have the have a law passed where it's replaced with a native native uh, tree species. So if a Bradford pear um, falls down, we don't replace it with a Bradford pear. We replace it with a willow oak or you know some a red maple, you know, or or an eastern redbud. Um, that way, you know, we're we're providing this food in the in the form of leaves and you know uh, for for all these for all these insects. Um, and and I always go back to insects that that's a baseline food for <laughs> for everything you're seeing you know right here on this page and and so many other the animals that we talked about um so there's all sorts of things that we can do but you know i mean the, i guess the bottom line is you know there's there's what uh, seven and a half billion humans if boy if we were really if we were in love with nature you know i, I don't think we would have <laughs> uh as many problems as as we do now you know with uh with wildlife um habitat loss you know so just just trying to spread the love of of nature uh, is is I, I think the the most important thing that we can do. Great. Well, we're coming up on our hour. I did want to let people know that the library does have uh, copies of the is it Ptolemy book, um, the Bringing Nature Home. Um, yes, and Bringing Nature Home, and and uh, the the one that was on the New York, New York Times bestseller list this year was um, Nature's Best Hope. So Bringing Nature Home, fantastic book. Uh, the, the, the newest book, uh, is nature's best hope. So I'm not sure if y'all have that one too, but I would yes, recommend we do. Both we have of them. that as well. Put a hold on it. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you read them, you will not garden the same. So please read them. <laughs>